Hello, everyone. I'm going to uh, present uh, Unit 8 Neural Networks today. Uh, we're still having trouble with the equipment in the classroom, so I'm recording this um, after the actual in-person lecture. All right, so this is kind of a, an exciting unit because we get to put together a lot of the things that we've learned until now in the course and see them do something that's... Um, I don't know, kind of remarkable in, in a certain sense. So the idea here is that we are re revisiting um, problems where the data is not linearly separable. So our approaches like multi or logistic regression and um, support vector classifier, they are not going to work well in this case. Uh, no linear classifier is going to work well because we cannot. Um, this is this is a situation where we have uh, two features. You can see we have green labels in the middle, blue labels on the outside, and there's no way we can formulate a linear classifier that's going to um, do a good job of separating this data. And in the previous unit, we learned about um, the support vector machine, which uses kernels that implicitly do a nonlinear transformation. Uh, but when we use those kernels, we're not really sure if they're going to work with a given data set or how well they'll work, they will work. And we don't have that many kernels to choose from, so it's uh, not completely satisfying. Um, what we're going to talk about now is whether we can actually learn a good transformation from the data itself. And um, the answer is yes, and we'll see how that's done. So um, <clears throat> the technique that we're going to use is a two-stage technique. Um, in the first stage, we are going to learn a transformation. So in the notation of the last chapter, we're going to learn our phi of x. And then in the second stage, we're going to apply that phi of x using just standard linear classification. And <clears throat> as we know, if we can do a good job of selecting that, the, that transformation phi, then linear classification should work well. The particular way that we're going to um, structure our fee is we are going to um, basically output the soft output of four different linear classifiers. So by soft output, when we talk about a classifier, soft output means that we're outputting something that can be interpreted as a probability, something between 0 and 1, whereas the hard output would mean you either output 0 or 1, but never anything else. Um, and in particular, um, as we know, when we have a linear classifier, so for example, in the picture here, this would be the boundary of a linear classifier, we're essentially asking that classifier to say, uh, how, how confident are we that the data falls on one side of the boundary versus the other side? So... Um, so for example, let's take this classifier here, and when we look at this picture here on the left, this shows the heat map. So where dark means probability is close to one, light means probability is close to zero, and it's telling us how confident we are that the data is to the left of that boundary. So as you can see, to the left you get dark red, to the right you get light. Um, <clears throat> And so we're going to construct four of these transformed features, four of these soft outputs. And then given those four, we're going to just apply linear classification. Um, <clears throat> one way to understand what we're doing, which is kind of visible from here, is we want to construct a region in the middle of our plot that covers the green points. And one way we can do that is we can sort of bound that region or approximate that region by this trapezoid. And so essentially, if we have these four lines here, we can say that when we're in that middle region, we should be you know, below this horizontal line to the northeast of this diagonal line to the east of this vertical line, 
and to the west of this other vertical line. And then essentially the, the if, you know, if, if we have uh, four different numbers that tell us where we are with respect to those lines, we can combine those numbers together to tell us when we're in this center region. And that combining is what this linear classifier does. And the first stage just generates those four numbers. So, <clears throat> and this is not something that we are deciding to do. You know, we're not, we're not deciding to place the line here. Everything here is learned. Um, we, we set up a structure that can basically implement four arbitrary linear classifiers. So these are, it's going to, you know, essentially put four lines somewhere. And then it's going to combine those using a linear classifier in an arbitrary way. But using maximum likelihood and our training data set and gradient descent, we are going to learn the classifier parameters, these ones, as well as the classifier parameters in the second stage that get the job done well. And as you can see with this heat map, where this final heat map is giving us the probability of a green point versus a blue point, you can see it's doing a really good job of covering the green area. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is really learning the features. Um, we're, we're setting up a structure. We're, we're telling it you have to learn four features. Those four features are going to be soft outputs of a linear classifier. And then we're telling the second stage you have to design a linear classifier here. We're going to use um, logistic regression as our loss. That stuff we're controlling, but the actual parameters we're learning. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so let's take a close look at what did get learned here. So again, this is the boundary it learned corresponding to the first um, of our transform features. And when you look at this picture down here, you can see that um, it, it's basically saying that the labels for class one for that classifier would be to the left, and then class not equal one, maybe we can call it class zero, would be to the right. Now, of course, notice that the green points are to the right of this line. It's sort of arbitrary where we place class zero or class one, since class zero is placed to the left, and we actually want to identify the green points to the right, what we're going to do is we're going to use a negative sign on the weight in the second classifier. And that negative sign is going to say, you know, that, that the final green points are going to be to the right of that vertical line. Something similar happens with the second feature, where we have learned that um, class one is to the southwest, but actually the green points are to the northeast. So we can remedy that with learning a negative weight in the second stage. And for the third um, transformed output, this is its boundary. And as you can see from this heat map down here, to the, to the south of it, that is class one. And that does cover the green points, so we don't need to use a negative sign on that weight. But then for the last point, you can see from the heat map that class label one is to the right. We want to identify to the left. So here again, we use a negative label. And again, these are, these are things that we are learning. It's, it's not that we, um, we design these negative signs. It's just that the whole structure sort of arbitrarily identified classes in particular directions and then learned to place negative signs to compensate. Okay, so that's, that's essentially um, the strategy here. There's other possible strategies that one could use in terms of uh, building and learning features, transformed features from the data. The one we're using is just um, a very standard one. It's, it's, the, it's the main way that people build um, neural network classifiers, but there are definitely other possibilities we could have done other things. Okay, so <clears throat> just re-looking at our two-stage approach with some equations, with some math. Um, the first stage is what we're going to call the hidden layer. That's because the outputs of the first stage are really some hidden quantities. 
um, that you, you can take a peek at if you look inside the, the overall approach, but you know they're neither the inputs nor the outputs of the approach. And then the second layer takes those transformed outputs or hidden layer outputs and converts them to the output. So here again, you see input two-dimensional features. This is our, um, our first stage. So we first do a linear classifier that outputs these scores. And then each one of the scores goes through a sigmoid. And if you remember, a sigmoid function is something that converts a real number to, you could say, a probability, some value between 0 and 1. So that's how we get our soft outputs. And here we have our four soft outputs. Those soft outputs then are just the inputs to a second stage linear classifier. This is now a binary classifier that's predicting green versus blue. And all we need is a single output for that. Um, this last stage here, we're doing another mapping from this score, which is a real number, to um, soft output probability, which is between 0 and 1. This is just really totally optional. We did it only to make this plot here. Um, if we were just interested in classification, we could get rid of this. And we know that just by thresholding these scores, like if, if the score is greater than 0, that would be you know class 1. If it's less than 0, that's not class 1. That, that's enough. And in fact, even for training the neural network, um, it's enough just to, to think about uh, these output scores. Okay, so this, this part is, is optional, but we did include it. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else? Um, this thing is called a multi-layer perceptron, in particular two layers. We have the hidden layer and the output layer. And it's a, also called a two-stage feed-forward neural network. There's all kinds of other ways to build neural networks where you could maybe have feedback, um, but this one is just feed forward. Okay, so, so how do we train the model? Well, first, what do we need to train? So we have all these parameters here in our first stage linear classifiers, and then we have these parameters in our second stage linear classifier. Those are the things we need to train. Um, everything else, like the fact that we have four outputs here, um, two stages that we are using these sigmoids. All that stuff is, those are just design choices we made. One could revisit them. Um, and, you know, maybe if you use three outputs, I think it would still work. You could get, you know, you could still bound that central region pretty well with three. If you use five, that would work too. Um, you could use many more than five. As we know, the danger with using too many, um, basically too much complexity in your model, is that you will have a lot more parameters to learn. And if your data set size is fixed and you increase the number of parameters, we know that that can lead to overfitting because your variance increases, whereas your bias doesn't really decrease very much. So um, we just used four as an example. Four works well enough. Um, we'll also talk about you know, replacing these uh, in just a few slides. OK, so the model parameters that we need to learn are all these weights and biases. Let's just all put them together into one quantity theta. And <clears throat> we have the training data. That's, that's what we have to learn them. And so now we can rely on our old friend logistic regression. Um, there's sort of a connection, as you, if you remember, logistic regression um, is based on that sigmoidal model. And the fact that we're using a sigmoid here um, suggests that we might want to think about this as linear regression. Sorry, logistic regression. So. Our logistic regression model, this is back from unit five, says the probability that the train, ith training label equals one, given the ith training feature vector, is this sigmoid. And here, notice in this case, this is going to be the output uh, score. OK, so I forgot to mention that we're going to use an h subscript for all the hidden layer quantities. 
hidden layer scores. Um, these A's, these are the outputs here. These are often called activations. And then the output quantities, they have a, an O um, subscript to denote them. Okay, so, so when we train our model, we're looking at the output. Um, the way that we derived the likelihood for uh, logistic regression back in Unit 5, we wrote it in terms of these outputs Z, and or ZO in this case. And if you want to expand those in terms of the output weights and biases, you can write them in terms of that expression. In any case, this is our uh, likelihood function. And what's kind of hidden in this expression is all the details in the network. All the details in the network are essentially how we go from X to Z O, right? All this stuff. So there's a lot going on there. It's hidden in the notation, but just we have to remember that this Z O is dependent on X. And in this case, we're going to just notate it like this. So there's this big function, which is this entire neural network that takes in X and puts out Z O and then ZO is really what's used to formulate our likelihood. Okay. Um, now we, we can rely on our old friend maximum likelihood to train the weights. So um, as we know, we want to minimize the negative log likelihood or minimize the sum of the negative log likelihood for each training sample. And we did this derivation back in Unit 5. Um, where we expressed it this way, and we called it the binary cross entropy loss. Okay, so notice that this is all written in terms of the Z's. Um, the next thing that we would need to figure out to do the optimization is we would need to take gradients of Z with respect to the different parameters. That's a little bit tricky. It's done through what's called the back uh, propagation approach, and we're going to talk about the details of that a bit later in this unit. Okay, so, um, you know, we've been calling this a uh, two-stage neural network. One might ask, why, why does it have this name? What does it have to do with neurons? And so, <clears throat> basically, a simple model of neurons uh, is kind of like this. You have these neuron cells. They have all these... Um, sort of sensory things. These are called the dendrites, and they sense current that are output from other neurons. And once you accumulate enough charge here, then this neuron will output a big burst of charge down its um, axon. And so if you think about sort of a mathematical model for this, um, what the neuron is doing is it's summing the charge from other, um, you know, from its dendrites. And maybe it weights some of them more than others. Maybe it finds some of them to be more relevant to its goal. And finally, once there's enough charge, there's some hysteresis here. Once there's enough charge, then all of a sudden it outputs something. So when you look at this structure, this looks very similar to one stage in our neural network where you have some input quantities, they get multiplied by some weights, they get summed together, and then they go through a scalar nonlinearity. <clears throat> so, um, so this connection is why we think about our artificial um, learnable structures as neural networks. <clears throat> okay, so a bit of history. Um, Already in the 40s, um, people were hypothesizing mathematical models for what happens in real biological neurons. Um, so this Hebbian learning was sort of a way of, of trying to hypothesize how these weights are actually updated <clears throat> in, in biology. Um, in the 50s, that's sort of when computers came about, <clears throat> people already started thinking about how they can implement these sorts of networks um, with computers. And the very first uh, 
ideas were just to look at single layer networks. And as we know, a single layer network with uh, you know, a sigmoid at the end, you can basically think of that as logistic regression. Uh, there were some very early computer implementations but of course, we know that these linear classifiers are, are pretty limited in what they can do. Also, compute power was extremely limited in those days. But the terminology, at least, this thing, the perceptron, basically that corresponds to a single layer neural network. And that was invented all the way back then. Then as time went on in the 60s, um, people started looking at uh, multi-layer neural networks and then they had to figure out how do we update the weights in the different layers, and they came up with this backpropagation algorithm, which is an efficient way to train them. We'll talk about that later in the unit. And then things kind of um, cooled off for a couple decades. Uh, things came back again in the 1990s. Neural networks got super popular. A lot of uh, people were working on them, uh, at least uh, you know, academic research. Um, but once again, uh, in the early 2000s, neural networks were no longer fashionable. Um, if you were still working on neural networks in the 2000s, you were, you know, really out of date. Um, little did people know that there would be another resurgence in the, you know, in the last decade. And the ideas are not really all that different from what people were using in the 1990s. Uh, the main differences were much more computational power, uh, much larger data sets. We're all, you know, much more interconnected now with our, with our cell phones and ability to uh, collect data and store data and exchange data. And all of these things led to um, a situation where the old ideas could all of a sudden really blossom. And the first breakthroughs were in speech and image processing, where um, neural network-based solutions were just completely dominating the best methods that had been designed up till that time. And then once people noticed um, how well that was working, they started applying deep, deep networks to all sorts of other fields. And nowadays, it's hard to find an area where deep networks have not touched yet. So we're, we're going to focus on deep networks in the next unit. Basically, a deep network is just something with more than two layers. Um, but we have plenty to talk about with just two-layer neural networks, so we're going to focus on those for, for this unit. So let's talk a little bit more generally about um, how these two-layer neural networks are formed. Um, first, I just want to mention a few things about this picture because as, as an electrical engineer, this picture could actually be a little bit confusing. So in, in a lot of our electrical engineering courses, when we draw block diagrams, we use arrows for the, um, for the variables or the signals, and then we use boxes for the systems. And actually what's done in computer science or with neural networks is often the opposite. So here, the, the boxes or the circles, these are actually the signals, and the arrows are the systems. Okay, so what these here represent are the input features. In this picture, we have three, but in general, we're going to have D input features, um, like always, like in all the previous units. Then we have a hidden layer where the processing is going to have um, a linear structure or what we could call affine linear. So there's some scaling terms and offset terms. And that's what these arrows represent. Um, well, actually, actually that's, that's part of it. So then there's also this nonlinear activation function. So there's a linear part and then there's this nonlinear part. And we have uh, we do that a number of times for every input, and we get a certain number of hidden units, and we're going to call dh the number of hidden units. Um, <clears throat> so here again, you see that the the processing is represented by the arrows, and the data, the hidden data, is represented by the circles. 
Finally, the output layer is going to do something very similar. We again have some affine linear uh, processing followed by some simple um, nonlinear processing. This final stage of processing in many cases is optional. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, if you do put it in there, you have to make an, an intelligent decision about what it's doing. Um, in particular, it should match the loss or, or maybe you could say it should match the task. And there's going to be a number of outputs here, which again has, has to match the loss or the task. So these networks, as we said, are, are known as multi-layer perceptrons. Um, in general, you could use more than two layers, in which case it would be called a deep network, but for now we'll just focus on two. Okay, so if we want to write that same picture um, in a little bit more of a traditional uh, ECE type block diagram, we would have something like this. So here we have the, the first affine linear layer is going to start with some vector of dimension d, apply a matrix multiply and an offset to get a new vector. We think of these as scores of dimension dh. <clears throat> and then each of these scores will be processed independently through some nonlinearity to get the corresponding activation A. Um, <clears throat> then that's the hidden layer. Then for the output layer, the outputs of the hidden layer are now the inputs of the output layer, the A's, the activations. We do another linear transform, and then optionally, we do um, an activation, another nonlinear processing of those. And also another, another thing that sometimes we do exclusively at the output layer is we might use an activation um, that's not separable. In other words, both inputs are used to compute both outputs, rather than, in this case, the first input is used for the first output, the second input for the second output, and so on. Okay. So um, again, we'll talk a little bit more about, about that in a couple slides. <clears throat> okay, so this is sort of more of a general scheme. Um, we have some choices to make when we implement these. We have to choose what kind of activations we're gonna use for the hidden layer. We also have to choose how many hidden layer quantities we're gonna use. We have to choose which activations we're gonna use here and how many quantities we're gonna use there. So for the hidden layers, um, probably the three most popular activations, especially for uh, what we call shallow networks, two layer networks would be sigmoids so the sigmoids are what we use in our demo. It's also what we use in um, logistic regression. And one of the things to note about the sigmoid is that the output is bounded. In other words, it can never be greater than one or less than zero, but the output is not centered around zero. As you can see, it's centered around 0.5. Um, <clears throat> this choice is sometimes used in shallow networks. There's a very closely related thing called the hyperbolic tangent, which is basically two times the sigmoid minus one. So it has the same shape as a sigmoid, except it goes from one to minus one. <clears throat> and the difference now is that the output is centered around zero. It is bounded like before. And um, so sometimes this actually works a little bit better than a sigmoid. And the reason why is a little bit um, convoluted, but basically when you have this centered data, it works a little bit better with the weight initializations that are assumed in the um, computational frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow. And essentially one, one big difference between the single layer case and the multi-layer case is we learned when we discuss logistic regression, that this single layer case gives us a convex optimization problem when we try to learn the weights and biases. And when it's a convex problem, 
you don't have to worry about bad local minima. You can just initialize anywhere, apply um, a well-designed optimization algorithm, and you will converge to a solution um, that has you know, the best performance. <clears throat> the situation differs when you put in these nonlinearities here, and now the, the, the problem is not convex <clears throat> in these weights and biases for the first layer. And as a result, it's much more challenging of an optimization problem. It does have local minima. If you're not careful in how you initialize or how you build your algorithm, you can get stuck in a bad local minima and have bad performance. And so a lot of engineering has been done to try to avoid that with the choices, with the designs of algorithms and the choices of initializations. And so this is one of the cases where um, there's some very specific initial weight initializations that are used in PyTorch, and they work a bit better when you have uh, centered outputs. Okay, another option is <clears throat> the rectified linear unit. These are uh, the most famous activations for deep networks. Uh, they're quite a bit different than our sigmoids and tan H's. Basically, whenever the input is zero or less, the output is zero. Whenever the input is positive, the output just repeats the input. So all it is is um, mathematically, it's max of zero and the input Z. So in this case, the output is unbounded, right? Can, can be as large as the input. It's also not centered. Um, <clears throat> it works pretty well in shallow networks, um, but for reasons we'll talk about in the next unit, it works um, much better than these other choices for deep networks. Okay, now talking about the output layer activation. Um, so here we said that uh, you really have to keep the task in mind. So if our task is binary classification, then first of all, we know that we just want a single output. We don't want more than one. So this ZO is a scalar. Uh, and there's really two options. Uh, one option for us is to use no output activation function at all, meaning just output ZO from the network and don't put it through some nonlinear function HO. That is enough because if you want to train the network, uh, our likelihood, we actually wrote it in terms of ZO. Um, and in terms of classification, if someone tells you what ZO is, you can threshold it uh, at zero or another number and that's sufficient for classification. So that is definitely an option. If you want to convert those real number scores into probabilities, then optionally you can put it through um, a non, uh, you know, nonlinear transform, but typically we're gonna do this with the logistic function, and that essentially means we're assuming this logistic model um, as, as a way of, of representing these scores as probabilities. And this logistic model is also compatible with logistic regression. Uh, I'll talk about that more in just a, maybe the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so they, they work well together. Now, if we're doing multi-class classification, let's say K has greater than two classes. So in this case, we know that we want to build, um, output a vector of K different scores. And the, the Jth score in this vector tells us essentially the confidence that the, a sample is in class J versus not in class J. And we have one of those J's for every uh, possible class. <clears throat> so um, here again, one option for us is to use no output activation function, simply output this vector. And for the purposes of classification, that's all we need because all we need to do then is look for the index of the largest z in the vector. And if that occurs at index j, then we report j as our guess for which class the, the input feature vector x was in. Also, if we want to do uh, training, we know that we can use multinomial logistic regression to train, jointly train all our weights and biases using this vector alone. Um, so that's, that's sufficient. Now, if you want to interpret this vector as a, as, a, as a probability vector, in particular probability mass function, um, then we can put those scores through the softmax. 
And so that's another option for us at the output of this um, <coughs> classification network. And that just makes the scores more interpretable, uh, the, the outputs more interpretable. And so the thing about the softmax to note is that <coughs> this is a transformation um, that takes in a vector of dimension k and outputs a vector of dimension k. So um, similar to what I drew over here, you know, we're taking in a dimension, dimension k vector, uh, reporting a dimension k vector, and the processing is not something that, you know, where the first output is only dependent on the first input. It actually, you have to process everything together. Okay, that differs from these activations, which are scalar to scalar. Okay, so, um, so again, the choices for the output layer activation are going to be task-based, and, um, <clears throat> and we also have uh, multiple options for these different cases. The last one to talk about is regression. So when we do regression, um, we really just want to take those raw scores as the output. We don't want to do any nonlinear post-processing to them. Um, and in other words, we don't want to use any output activation function. So for regression, you would basically just get rid of this. All right. Uh, all right, so last thing to talk about today is how we train them, what loss functions to use. And here again, this is going to be task-based. So when we think about <clears throat> Binary classification, um, the most common approach for these neural networks is to use um, the logistic regression model. So here's our, here's our um, probabilistic model that relates the labels to the features. And notice that this, this is written just in terms of that final output score. And the, the likelihood as a whole over the training data is going to be the product of these and as we saw before, you know, we, we look at the negative log likelihood, we look at minimizing that. That gives us this loss where you have a sum over your training samples and then the, the negative log of these guys. So the first way we're writing it here is, is exactly how we wrote it back in Unit 5. Um, and as you can see, it's written in terms of the output scores. So those are, um, you know, not post-processed by... Um, the sigmoid function. Now, if you want to process those scores by the sigmoid function and as a result get these activations out, these are going to be numbers between 0 and 1, you can actually rewrite your loss function in terms of those final outputs A, and then it has this form. Um, so either way, if, if you, uh, you know, you, if you could minimize this loss function um, or the first one, you should get up to numerical precision. You should get exactly the same solution. So um, it's, uh, I, I think that uh, the first one is slightly better in terms of um, numerical precision issues, but um, either one of them should work, you know, almost exactly as good as the other. So it's not really a desi design decision. It's just sort of an arbitrary choice which one you'd like to use. Okay, so for the multi-class classification with k greater than two classes, um, <clears throat> now when we, back in unit five, we studied this problem, multinomial logistic regression. We used this model, and this was also, we call this the softmax. Then our complete likelihood function is the product of all those guys over our training samples. And we did a derivation where we looked at the negative log likelihood. That gives us this loss here, which the way we derived it originally, we wrote it in terms of the scores, ZO. But we could also um, write it in terms of the softmax outputs. So if we put our scores through that softmax, and then we get these AOs. Um, so the vector, if you, if you vectorize this across K, you get a PMF. And now if you want to form a loss with that PMF, you can do so very um, 
succinctly here. And similar to the earlier case, you could either do optimization of this loss or optimization of the other one. They should both give you the same weights and biases. And the final task that we've studied until now in the course is regression. In the general case, we are um, estimating or predicting k different quantities where k could be greater than 1. <clears throat> and the likelihood model that we, um, we learned about when we studied maximum likelihood uh, was additive white Gaussian noise. And we also learned that this likelihood model, when you look at the negative log likelihood, it gives you the quadratic or RSS model that we saw back in units one and two. So here, this is the most uh, common loss that's used to train a regression network, but you have other choices. You know, you could, for example, um, replace the square with an absolute value, use L1 loss, sometimes that's done in image processing. You have other options, but the most common one is the quadratic, which you can link back to um, an assumption that the noise is Gaussian, zero mean, and um, constant variance across samples. Okay, so basically that's, that's how we can build these structures and um, <clears throat> train them. And we have a few more details to talk about in terms of how we do the training, which we'll talk about next time. Um, we'll learn about the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. We'll learn about how to compute the gradients efficiently through backpropagation. And then finally, we'll learn about how to implement everything with a um, package, a Python package called PyTorch. <clears throat>